Okay, good morning. This is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. It is Wednesday, August 10th, and this is our business agenda, and we will start with a roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Ackerman. Present. Commissioner Bogue. Here. Commissioner Cross. Present. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Mesner. Here. Commissioner Oath. Commissioner Robbins. Here. Mr. Chair, you have six out of seven commissioners present. Great. Good morning, everybody. Good to see everyone. Um, <clears throat> we will roll with our agenda. We start with general public comment. Uh, hearings Manager Larson, do we have Ms. Dugan who signed up? We are looking for her right now, so give us a moment. I'm looking as well. We do have Ms. Dugan. We will bring her in. While we uh, await the arrival of Ms. Dugan, does any commissioner have general comments? Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to make a quick comment in appreciation of staff. We were able to sit into their uh, biannual meeting yesterday and uh, had a great opportunity to recognize uh, many members of the COGCC staff uh, for their exceptional work throughout the year and wanted to uh, mention that publicly, how much we appreciate the work that they are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's all I have. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Ackerman. Agreed. So, Mr. Chair, we do have Ms. Dugan in the meeting. Um, if we'd like to start with her comment. Ms. Dugan, you can uh, unmute yourself and start your video if you like. Thank you. Um, my name is Sandra Dugan. I live in Weld County. I wanted to thank you for pushing for precise language regarding the best management practices proposed for the Bronco Comprehensive Area Plan. We can't afford to rely on promises to consider protections for our health and environment. If we don't have precise language around electrification and produced water management, it seems logical that the cap would be denied until that can be solidified. How else would we know to what extent these caps would reduce cumulative impacts? I would like to speak on behalf of directly impacted residents in my community who are unable to attend these meetings due to them being overly complicated and scheduled during the workday. We have compiled a petition that has been signed by, by 89 Colorado residents who fundamentally oppose the Bronco and Box Elder Caps. You can look for the petition in your inbox. The petition states, as residents of Colorado, we are deeply concerned about the consequences and cumulative impacts of large scale oil and gas operations and the impacts to our health, air quality, water resources and wildlife. We are appalled to know that the oil and gas industry has submitted plans for the development of the 200 well frac site in Weld County known as the Bronco Cap and the 150 plus well frac site within the city of Aurora known as the Box Elder Cap. The approval of either of these caps, let alone both, will indisputably accelerate the climate crisis, further degrade our already poor air quality and permanently deplete our limited water supply. We cannot stand by as we continue to put our lives and li livelihoods at risk. The National Environmental Policy Act defines cumulative impacts as the impacts on the environment resulting from the incremental impacts of the actions when added to other past, present, and reasonably foreseeable future actions. The cumulative impact of these proposed developments would be massive. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dugan for the commentary. Uh, and I will note for the record that <clears throat> I received in my inbox, and I believe the fellow commissioners received the aforementioned petition, um, which we have reviewed. Um, and we will make sure that that's part of the record um, with regard to the Bronco cap submittal. So um, with that, I believe, Ms. Larson, that concludes public comment. That's the only person that's... That is correct, Mr. Chair, yes. All right, uh, moving forward, um, we now have a consent agenda. 
Does any commissioner have questions with regard to consent? Seeing no questions, do we have a motion to approve consent? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of consent signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, consent agenda is approved. All right, we now will move to docket 21120237. Uh, this is Kerr McGee Oil and Gas Onshore LP, and this is the Bronco Comprehensive Area Plan. Um, Ms. Larson, I, I noted from the public uh, sign up that Ms. Dugan signed up twice. Um, but she did articulate her areas of concern with regard to the Bronco. So I believe she's uh, accomplished what she planned on doing in terms of the petition, et cetera. So I do not believe we need to call upon her again. Is that accurate to your knowledge? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, then um, at that point, I believe we would recognize uh, the applicant. And I see that we've got Ms. Jost with us now. Yes, good morning. Good morning. good morning. And I just want to double check. Um, Mimi, we've got the whole list of panelists to bring in. Um, Chair Robbins, would you like us to wait till everyone is in and before we start? Why don't we do that? Um, I think that makes for a better record. And then we'll have everybody with us. Um, and so I, if, I, if I recall correctly, it was quite a slew of people. So let's yes. take about I don't know, five minutes and, and get everybody on board. Great. Thank you very much. One, two, three, four, five. I see six commissioners. I see Ms. Jost. Uh, Ms. Jost, at this time, we will recognize you and your clients uh, for the presentation on the Bronco cap. Excellent. Thank you, Chair. And we have not prepared a full PowerPoint presentation like we did last time, but I'll give a short opening statement, kind of an overview. And then if we'd like to, I can pull up the clean version of the exhibit four that was submitted last Friday, and we can walk through that with any questions you may have, if that works, if that pleases the commission. Yeah, the, the, the only point I would make is that when we get to deliberation, we certainly wanna be deliberating on clean version, but. Red line might also help so that we can see edits, et cetera, changes. So, you know, however you want to do it, but uh, just note that for the record. Great. Thank you, Chair. I will have both at the ready. <laughs> well, great. Well, thank you. Good morning, commissioners, staff, council, and members of the public. My name is Jamie Jost from Jost Synergy Law, and I, along with my partner, Kelsey Wiselinki, represent Kermagee Oil and Gas Onshore in this continued hearing on the Rule 314 Bronco Cap. We appreciate the opportunity to be back in front of you today to further discuss the cumulative impact aspects of the cap. I've prepared a short overview of the updated Exhibit 4, the Comprehensive Area Plan, that was provided to the Commission last Friday, and we also have a host of subject matter experts here to answer any questions you may have about the updated Exhibit 4 or other items. On Friday afternoon, Kermagee submitted a red line and a clean version of Exhibit 4, the Comprehensive Area Plan, that first updated the plan to include additional events and items that have occurred since its submittal in December 2021 and its amended submittal in April 2022 to ensure that the plan is current. And second, clarified and updated where necessary best management practices and mitigation measures for the areas of the plan addressing cumulative impacts. As Exhibit 4 now stands, it reflects the current posture of the cap prior to commission approval and contains clear and concise summaries of BMPs that will be utilized at all 11 oil and gas locations within the cap, or if there's not a clear commitment to a BMP noted in Exhibit 4, then there is a reference as to why and when it will, re and when it will be reviewed as part of the subsequent OGDP, Form 2A, or Form 2 commission process. There is substantial amount of BMPs, as well as avoidance, mitigation, and minimization measures referenced in the updated Exhibit 4, but we wanted to specifically confirm three of them for the Commission today. First, Kermagee remains firmly committed to having oil and gas pipelines in place prior to the date of first production from any well in the cap. 
Additionally, upon further discussions internally and externally, Kermagee will commit to having produced water lines in place, as well as in order to reduce the trucking concerns conveyed by the commissioners at last week's hearing. Second, Kermagee remains committed to utilizing group three drilling muds on each of the 11 locations within the cap. And then third, Kermagee committed to submitting a comprehensive wildlife mitigation plan for the Bronco cap area. Since the hearing last week, Kermagee has been in almost constant conversations with Brandon Moret at CPW. They conducted an on-site with CPW on Friday, August 5th, 2022, and also submitted a draft 30-page comprehensive wildlife mitigation plan to Brandon Mara on Monday, August 8th. The draft comprehensive wildlife mitigation plan includes numerous proposed operating requirements and proposed avoidance, minimization, and mitigation measures for each of the 11 locations on the Survey Ranch. Since Kermagee is not seeking preliminary siting approval, the Commission and CPW will have additional opportunities to review the operating requirements and wildlife BMPs on a site-specific basis through the OGDP process. In addition, there were revisions to the emissions estimates, making them significantly lower. Kermagee was conservative when they put together the initial emissions calculations last year because best management practices were not yet in place. For the 11 cap locations, Kermagee has applied additional BMPs for these locations that serve to lower emissions calculations. These are the use of natural gas generators for the drilling rigs. The initial calculation used a mix of diesel and natural gas. The use of lower emitting tier four engines for completions. The initial calculations used tier two and the addition of water gathering. We understand that the commissioners have reviewed the updated exhibit four in detail. So I would direct your attention specifically to pages 15 through 20 of the clean version of amended exhibit four for the full table of BMPs that Kermagee has committed to include on each OGDP and form 2A for the 11 locations within the cap. After reviewing and updating exhibit four, Kermagee appreciates the request of the commission to include a simple singular table of BMPs for ease of review and also appreciates the overall discussion and thoughtful commissioner in interaction at the hearing last week. One point of clarification that we do need to bring to your attention is on page 18 of the clean version of exhibit four. That BMP regarding the comprehensive wildlife mitigation plan provides that, and I'm gonna quote this, a comprehensive wildlife mitigation plan that has been approved by CPW will be submitted prior to the first OGDP submittal. However, there's no COGCC or CPW rule that requires approval of CPW of the wildlife mitigation plan, only formal consultation. So we would like to modify that BMP to quote to state a comprehensive wildlife mitigation plan that has been prepared in formal consultation with CPW will be submitted prior to the first OGDP submittal. We think this language is reflective of the current regulations and confirms the commission's authority to formally adopt and approve the proposed wildlife plans as part of the OGDP process. So to conclude the opening statement, Kermagee has taken this commission's requests and evaluations into account in the updated exhibit four and renews its request that the commission approve the Bronco cap application and also confirm that Kermagee has conveyed the rights set forth in Rule 314B1, 2, 3, and 4 for the development of the CAP application lands. Um, with that, we have a host of subject matter experts ready to answer any questions you may have. And um, Chair, as you like, um, we can pull up the clean or the red line version in any discussions we have today, if you'll just direct me as to what you would like to do at any given point in time. Thank you, Ms. Jost. Um, I'm, I'm going to spring something on you, and I apologize for this, but on page 39 of your initial PowerPoint, you had the requested relief identified, and that is altered today. For instance, the <clears throat> not doing the form 2B unless requested is, is one of the alterations from the original requested relief. Could you get your staff to put together a 
requested relief slide so that the commissioners and I can know precisely what it is you're asking us to, to, to vote upon, because it has changed as a result of the dialogue and your amended exhibit four. And I just want to make sure that we're very clear in terms of if we get to the vote today, we know what it is that's being asked by the applicant. Is, is, is that fair? Absolutely, Chair. Yes, I can work with Kelsey and we can get that slide prepared so we can bring that up here in a few minutes. Okay. Yep. So, uh, Commissioners, sorry to launch into that, but I think it is important for us to ensure that we know what is being asked of us. And it has altered as a result of the deliberation discussion and the new information that has been filed. Um, at this time, um, we will move into commissioner question and comments. And so I open the floor for any commissioner who's desirous of raising a hand to initiate any questions or comments with the applicant and our panel that's before us. Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you, Ms. Jost for the, the update. And I appreciated the red line version and the, the changes. I'm wondering if you can explain to me again um, what it means if, if CPW doesn't approve the wildlife plan, could you please explain your alternate suggested language and how you see that working and ensuring that we're approving something that we know that CPW approves of, even though there's no official approval in our rules? Yes, thank you, Commissioner McGowan. That's a great question. Um, so as we understand the rules for purposes of not only the cap, but also um, just how formal consultation works, there's no COGCC rule that requires CPW to have a formal approval of a wildlife mitigation plan um, or a wildlife protection plan. What we do as operators is we work with CPW um, consistently, but we also provide um, all of the feedback in formal consultations. And so that formal consultation, whether it's one or whether it's 10 meetings, ultimately gets CPW and the operator to a place where a wildlife mitigation plan can be submitted to the commission staff to review, and then to you as the commissioners for final approval. So we kind of view it as a little bit of a matter of semantics, um, but there would be no formal like stamp of approval on the CPW comprehensive wildlife mitigation plan, because by rule and regulation that actually can only happen through you at the commission. Um, but as we've stated, we will continue to fully engage in the formal consultation as considered under the rules. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I wonder if um, I would be able to ask Councillor Davenport for some clarification on that. I, I think 1202D does require uh, density locations in HPH, including pronghorn winter range uh, concentration areas to have a CPW approved wildlife mitigation plan. But um, I know I'm hitting him a bit cold, but perhaps he could take a look at 1202D for us and clarify that. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I'm looking at 1202D right now, and it does require a CPW approved wildlife mitigation plan or other CPW approved conservation plan and cons compensatory mitigation for wildlife resources pursuant to rule 1203. AAG Davenport, if I may, I'm sorry if I can chair jump in here with a question. Thank you. And it's my understanding that that's required at the site specific OGDP level and that wasn't specifically tied to the cap. Um, and so just for purposes of maybe some delineation and clarification, that would be helpful because we did understand that that rule would apply at the OGDP level, but we are at a different stage today. Yes, Ms. Jost, that, that clarification is accurate. It does apply that pursuant to the terms of that rule, it does apply to OGD, OGDPs. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner Ackerman. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that discussion and clarification. I appreciate that. I do have a couple of other comments, if I may, Mr. Chair. Please. Thank you. Um, 
I appreciated uh, your work on on working through this cap. I think a lot of good work was done since our last meeting, and really appreciate the uh, the hard work and the quick work that was done on this. Um, the intent of a cap is to develop oil and gas locations while avoiding, minimizing, and mit mitigating impacts to public health, safety, welfare, <clears throat> the environment, and wildlife resources through systematic planning of infrastructure location, best management practices, and centralizing facilities. I think this cap does a good job of many of those things and really appreciate the work that's been done. I did have one comment associated with uh, wildlife beyond that, which I've already made, and I, I mentioned in written format and in uh, testimony at our last meeting that the primary mitigative strategy for high priority habitat for pronghorn winter concentration areas is the avoidance of development of activities between January 1st and April 30th um, in order to protect wintering pronghorn and ask that that be recognized in the cap. And I don't see it in here, and I'm not sure if I missed it, Ms. Jost, or if it was a, a purposeful intent to not put that here um, and instead focus on the, uh, the mitigation plan and wondered if you could expand on that just a little bit. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair, and absolutely, Commissioner Ackerman, thank you for the question. Um, we anticipated that that question may be asked today. <laughs> um, so you are correct that there is no commitment to the timing stipulations in the amended and revised Exhibit 4, um, but that's we believe that there's good reason for that, at least at this point in time. Um, first off, this is a cap that is not asking for preliminary siting analysis on any of the 11 locations. And so as this cap goes through, if approved the six year process, the six year allowance for the um, time under rule 314, we wanted to ensure that there was additional time necessary to work specifically with CPW, Brandon Merritt hand in hand as the six years progresses um, on each of those site specific locations with the additional formal consultation. Um, the other aspect is that, again, because we have submitted a draft 30-page um, comprehensive wildlife mitigation plan with Brandon, we're in the early throes of those discussions and working through that plan with Mr. Merritt. And so we thought it might be basically premature to include the timing steps at this point in time, specifically because we are working through the comprehensive it's a lot, a lot of words, comprehensive wildlife mitigation plan um, with Brandon over the course of the next few weeks. Um, and then really finally is that we really want to just um, focus on the fact that yes, timing stipulations do allow for avoidance, but there are other avoiding, mitigating and minimizing best management practices that can be utilized, even if development does occur during those timing stipulations. And we'd like to can you continue to explore those with Mr. Merritt as our conversation progresses on the Comprehensive Wildlife Mitigation Plan. So that's why you haven't seen them today, um, but we wanted to provide you with our reasons. Thank you for your response, Ms. Jost. Thank you for the question. I think that um, it would be helpful to have some of that discussion that we just heard somewhere within the record, or are you comfortable with it being in the record in that fashion. What are your thoughts on that? Thanks, Mr. Chair. I presume that that's to me, is that correct? Yeah, I, I was asking you, sorry, putting you on the spot. Okay. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that being in the record. I, I, I would prefer that it was in the document. I do think that recognition of that as the, the key and primary mitigative strategy is an important uh, process. I, I am satisfied that CPW, our uh, expert on wildlife, uh, will work together with uh, the applicant and ensure that those BMPs are in practice. Um, and so I have confidence with it in the record that it will move forward. Uh, but yes, would prefer to see it in the document since this is a, a wider planning document. I think recognition of that is appropriate, um, but uh, you know, could live with it being on the record. So, Ms. Jost, as we're you know, having further discussion with your panelists, uh, you may want to get Ms. Wazalinki to, I don't know, craft up a sentence or something that could be part of the ask that, you know, we're all on the same page in terms of how you're going to do it. But if we could make sure that it's part of any motion, I think that could be helpful. 
Thank you, Chair. And, and just for a point of clarification, um, in the requested relief slide that we're putting together, I guess I would view that as um, including the BMP that we modified um, on page 19, and I'm getting there, that maybe we put as part of the requested relief that the language of a comprehensive wildlife mitigation plan has been prepared in formal consultation with CPW will be submitted prior to the first OGDP submittal. Um, I guess my question would be, is that enough to have in the requested relief slide, um, recognizing that between my statement and then Commissioner Ackerman's statement and discussion that that is fully part of the record? I just wanna make sure I'm clear on the ask. Yeah, um, and I'm trying to facilitate this discussion. So uh, Commissioner Ackerman. Yeah, thank you again. Um, I did see that and appreciate that uh, commitment. I think formal recognition of timing stipulations being the primary uh, mitigative strategy in a overarching plan such as a cap is appropriate. Okay, so I think we're getting to the to to a good spot. I just want to be you know careful. Um, you know, it's a it's a six year vested right. We want to make sure that we all understand uh, what has been potentially approved. Um, and what the next steps are. So that's why we're trying to be very, you know, clear in terms of the potential requested relief. And I appreciate you and Ms. Wazalinki putting together a, a, a slide to help us with that. Other questions from commissioners? Commissioner Cross? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And and Ms. Jost, I want to thank you and, and your client as well for preparing this in, in short notice. Um, I want to start off just by saying that I think the revised Exhibit 4 is very helpful. Um, I, I think the way it's set out, specifically identifying BMPs that you are considering, that you are committing to, that you are not committing to, I think is a very helpful way to do it. Um, I also want to say I appreciate the qualitative analysis that's provided in there. Um, I think you guys do have a good story to tell and highlighting some of, I think it's a good way to allow your client to, for lack of a better term, brag a little bit about some of the steps that they have taken in the past, as well as some of the steps that they're willing to commit to in the future. Um, and so I think that's an important way um, that you can try and show those steps that you're, you're trying to do responsible oil and gas development. Um, so thank you for that. And I, and I hope that you continue to do that in the future. Um, I did want to have a couple kind of clarifying questions. Um, the first is with respect to the conversation that you just had with Commissioner Ackerman. One of the things that you mentioned with respect to the consultation with CPW is that you were going to have six years to try and work this out, um, you know, at a site specific stage, making sure that you're trying to take into account everything, whether it be avoidance through timing stipulations, other minimization measures or mitigation measures. And I just wanted to try and clarify something with timing because last time um, you and your client both specified that this was the highest priority for your client at this time and trying to make sure and going through kind of the timing process and that you would be submitting OGDPs fairly soon after approval and kind of on what you had called a regular schedule a regular schedule after that, potentially in two, potentially in three OGDPs. Um, with the consultation ongoing, do you foresee any kind of change in that schedule? Yep. Uh, Chair, if I may, um, Commissioner question, or Commissioner Cross, great question. Um, we don't see any change in the schedule. And what I was referring to was, you know, when, when the cap, if approved, has a lifespan under Rule 314 of six years, um, you know, from Kerr McGee's perspective, as the OGDPs get submitted on the schedule discussed last week, I mean, they expect to submit the first OGDP within six months of approval, if that occurs, that process is still ongoing. What I was trying to say is that that consultation basically will never stop with CPW, um, whether it be as part of the comprehensive wildlife mitigation plan that we will continue to have formal consultation on that will be in a place to submit prior to the submission of the first OGDP in the unit or in the cap. So within the next six months, for example, and then any individual oil and gas location that comes through the OGDP form 2A process 
will also have site-specific formal consultation with CPW. So my reference was really just to kind of ensure the commission that it's continuing consultation, not that Kerr-McGee was expanding its timing schedule over the life of six years. It was just tying it to the six-year allowance under the rule. And thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Um, and then the second one that I wanted to talk about um, was also a little bit of clarity, and it was with respect to one of the shall be considered BMPs that you had. Um, and, and specifically on the clean version of your new exhibit for it's on page 18 with respect to the air BMPs. You mentioned the, the lack of electrical infrastructure to support electric drilling um, and said probably not going to be supplied in the foreseeable future. Um, is it, is this something that you have an idea of timelines that infrastructure may be available out there? Is it something that you're going to push for with it being a shall be considered OGDP or sorry, BMP? Yes, thank you, Commissioner Cross. And um, Mr. Honus has come on from Kerr McGee. So I'm gonna direct this question to him. And then also, if I may, can I ask everyone else who's on from Kerr McGee to go ahead and turn on your cameras? Thank you. Mr. Honus, would you like to go ahead and jump in? You bet. Um, the infrastructure out in this area is just horrible when it comes to the electric grid standpoint. Um, there is no way to get electric power out there to power a drilling rig. We left the foreseeable future in there only because if something crazy happened over the next long, long, long term out there, we didn't want to close the door to it. But the honest truth is, and just being blunt, it's going to be a natural gas rig and there's we're not getting electricity out there anywhere in the foreseeable future. I, I appreciate that. And, and it's I think it's helpful to understand that. And I think similarly, um, can you give us an idea of how many electrical rigs are available for use for operators in the state? So um, that's kind of an interesting question. Uh, you can upgrade a rig to be able to run off of electric power. So it's not so much that there aren't electrical rigs available. Uh, most of the rigs in the basin can be slightly tweaked and modified to be able to run off of high line or electrical power. Uh, that's usually not the limiting factor. The limiting factor is lead time on getting the transformers that you need to be able to run it. So there is a decent amount of lead time to get a rig upgraded. But outside of that, it's generally the electrical grid and the ability to supply the power uh, to the rig that becomes the limiting factor. Perfect. I appreciate that. I again, I think that's that's helpful information for for the commission to have to to better understand why at times electrical dr or drilling rigs are considered and why at times they're not. So I I appreciate that clarification. Um, aside from that, I'll I'll yield my time back. Thank you, Commissioner Cross. Uh, other commissioners with questions, Commissioner Messner. Uh, actually, Mr. Chair, I don't have questions. Um, I'm happy to begin deliberations or, 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 or talk about this a little bit, but I didn't have any questions for the applicant. Okay, very good. Uh, does anybody else have any questions for the applicant before we move into the deliberation phase? Well, uh, with that, Commissioner Messner, um, I'll take you up on your deliberation after I recognize uh, Attorney Jost. Thank you, Chair. So sorry to interrupt here. Um, just for purposes of the slide for the requested relief that we'll be providing, um, after you deliberate, um, if we may take maybe 10 minutes so I can formalize that slide with my client and then get it to the commission, um, would that work okay? Just we want to make sure we have our client's blessing on what we want to provide. Yeah, that's fair. I'm, I'm willing to recognize that break to accommodate what deliberative strokes you may see from the commissioners here in the next few minutes. Great, thank you, Commissioner Chair. Messner, would you like to lead off? Thank you, Mr. Chair, happy to. Um, I do wanna share my thanks to the applicant for making revisions to the application, the product that was provided uh, in exhibit four um, after last week's hearing is, is where I think it needs to be. I mean, that's a good product. It's clear, it's understood. There's narratives, there's qualitative analysis. 
there's quantitative analysis. It looks at the big pictures. It's clear what you're committing to and what you're not committing to. Um, that that type of product is certainly something that I think um, is helpful in trying to review these applications and to make uh, make things as clear as possible as far as what is going to happen and what is not going to happen. And so I appreciate that. Uh, I particularly appreciate the firm commitments to uh, the pipeline infrastructure, both to produce water and the oil and gas takeaway. I appreciate the um, the commitment to uh, well, the clarification that I think I believe you were already committed to electrifying all your production facilities, um, and that commitment to working with CPW and developing a comprehensive wildlife mitigation plan, I think is really, I think it's really important. I think it's important to understand that it's a, it's a, it's a comprehensive wildlife mitigation plan. It's not a site specific wildlife mitigation plan. And so my uh, expectation for that is that it covers the entire cap prior to the submittal of the first OGDP. So every site associated with that cap holistically, in my opinion, needs to be uh, considered within that comprehensive wildlife mitigation plan. And I think Commissioner Ackerman hit the nail on the head when he stated that th there is no question that during the mission change rulemaking that our rules you read the statement of basis and purpose clearly indicates that there is a hierarchy of first avoid then minimize and where there are unavoidable impacts then you can mitigate those and the timing stipulations associated in high priority habitat are the primary way to avoid impacts to wildlife and high priority habitat short of not operating in high priority habitats and so i do hope that that consideration is given by cpw within that uh, wildlife mitigation plan. <clears throat> um, I also, while I agree that the ultimate authority for approval of the wildlife mitigation plan lies with this commission, I also believe that this commission um, would not likely approve a wildlife mitigation plan that was not supported and approved by Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And so I think it's important that Colorado Parks and Wildlife feels empowered to be able to be honest in their analysis and in their expectations for what needs to be included in a, in a wildlife mitigation plan. Um, but generally speaking, after the modifications associated with this application and the clarity uh, and narratives uh, included, I think this is a strong application for a comprehensive area plan. I, I don't think that at least this commissioner didn't think that when we developed the rules for the comprehensive area plan that people would ask for comprehensive area plans without preliminary siting. Um, I do hope that that's not going to occur very much in the future because I really think the idea of the comprehensive area plan is to include preliminary siting so we really can dive into a little more of the details and um, and look at things more holistically. Um, I acknowledge that this is something that was allowed in the rules but I don't think that was the intent of the rules and so uh, nonetheless, um, I do think that in this situation, this uh, uh, this is a, a strong cap application without preliminary citing. I also appreciate the um, willingness to uh, commit to providing two Bs uh, should the director or the commission determine that that's necessary on the individual OGDP uh, level. So uh, those are my initial thoughts, but I can be uh, in support of this application. Thank you, Commissioner Messner. Um, <clears throat> your comments actually uh, bring a question to the fore for me. Uh, Ms. Jost, and, and I didn't ask this previously, but the, the point made by Commissioner Messner about not asking for preliminary citing, um, and, and maybe we had this discussion and I missed it, but does someone on your team want to sort of uh, reflect on that, like why that was not? Salt. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there's good legitimate reasons, and I'm just trying to understand why versus why not. Yeah, Chair, and I'm happy to answer that question. And then if anyone from the team wants to jump in as well, please feel free. Um, you know, first, first and foremost, we really were wanting to continue to work with Mr. Servi 
on working through um, the surface use agreement as well as his desires as to where he would want those locations to be on his ranch. And with the ability to submit a cap without preliminary siting approval request, um, as the rules allow, um, Kermagee did want to go ahead and get this cap in play um, for purposes of commissioner review, because we also know caps take a very long time to go through the process. Um, as you see, the, you know, the evolution with Mr. Servi was ultimately beneficial, and the surface use agreement was in place that was able to confirm those 11 oil and gas locations on his land. So that's why we did not seek preliminary siting from the outset, and I think we, we recognize the comments made by Commissioner Messner and others with respect to the utilization of the rule um, for preliminary siting. But again, with this one, um, it wasn't required. And so we just wanted to go ahead and proceed with the cap as allowed by the rule without that. And I see yeah. Mr. Cook has joined. Sorry, Chair, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Cook. Did you want to add anything? I see you joined us. No, that, that was what I was going to say as well. Thank you. Good. Okay. And, and yeah, I mean, again, we, we recognize the rule allows the not preliminary siting. Um, I'm just... As we proceed through these initial caps, whether it's with siting or without siting, I think it's helpful to everyone to get some perspective on how the rules are used and the whys around that um, so that we become more informed. The rules help sort of develop themselves as we go through them, as you're well aware of, Ms. Jost, with regard to rules and case law, et cetera. And so I think that's helpful to, to sort of get that on the record. Um, so thank you for that uh, additional information around that decision issue on behalf of your clients. You're welcome. Commissioners, um, others that desire to continue to facilitate deliberation. Commissioner McGowan, then Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I agree with my fellow Commissioner um, Mesner on his comments and I, um, this decision is a little bit easier for me now to, to make and to support this application. I think, um, again, we talked about this last week, the double-edged sword is you're the first to go, which means you're experiencing kind of, you know, our questions about how does this work and how, what does this look like? And for me, the, it's important for us to have as much information and details and commitments up front for a cap because the exchange is we're maybe not getting those commitments or de details for some of the individual OGDPs that we're gonna see related to the cap. And so that piece was really important to me. I'm also appreciative that um, the number of sensitive receptors is as minimized as possible. And I, I appreciate also the willingness and um, commitment to work on a, an overall wildlife mitigation plan with CPW because that's kind of the, the big, piece here in this particular application. But I also, um, and, and I know that we've talked about this in several commission meetings. For me, you know, public health is related to emissions, even if you're not actually near within 2000 feet of humans. I think the perspective for an operator to say, how do I minimize emissions as much as possible, especially when you're looking at this large development and this many wells, is really important from my perspective when I'm looking at an application. Um, and in particular, when you're in the non-attainment area, I think we need to be cognizant of what our role is and our partnership with CDPHE and the commitments for the state to try to re reduce and minimize certain types of emissions. And so in this particular cap and application, I'm appreciative that I have more details from the applicant about what you can or cannot do as far as technology and minimizing emissions and updating your um, emissions estimates to reflect the technology that you're going to use. And um, I'm appreciative of that. So I, I like the red line. I think it's much improved over the original application. And I appreciate the work that's that's gone into revising this. Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and <clears throat> I wanted to say, given some of the public comment we've received on this uh, action, I wanted to recognize for the record that, you know, a cap is not a final blanket approval of multiple locations, as has been pointed out in previous hearings. 
Um, each location will go through its OGDP process and ultimate approval that will still be required. The intent of cap planning is to implement the longstanding beneficial philosophy of master planning. Um, Kerr McGee, McGee has done a good job of that in this uh, first initial cap, and it's evidenced by their pipeline and infrastructure planning, their centralization of facilities, um, and various other issues that we've discussed and vetted throughout these hearings. I appreciate Kerr McGee and their good work on this cap. And with the modification we've discussed here today, um, I also am in support of this cap. Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I want to start off by saying, um, I, again, just reiterating that I, I do appreciate the, the changes that were made. I, I do think it's helpful. And as prior commissioners have indicated, I think the telling of the story is, is an important way to do it. Um, generally with CAPS, you know, I, I, think that, I think that they are a vital tool. And when you look at our statement of basis and, and, and purpose and points, it, it, you really see that it's a critical way for this commission to both consider and address cumulative impacts as required by our <laughs> legislative and statutory directive. Um, and, and so I think that this is a good example of exactly how that is shown. Um, there are numerous, numerous operators within this area, within the cap boundary, and as opposed to having you know four or five different operators each trying to come in with OGDPs and each trying to set up their own infrastructure and move everything out. We're now having one operator consolidating locations, consolidating infrastructure. And that I think takes important steps to try and make sure that we are minimizing as much as possible, different emissions, different surface disturbance, um, fragmentation of, of habitat, et cetera. And so I, I do think that it's important and, and you know, I think that this has been an important learning process for operators as a whole, but as well for as our commission, that we are taking the steps to try and, you know, work through this and, and it being the first one. So I, I appreciate the hard work on that. Um, I, I just want to ultimately say that I am in, I am in favor of supporting this, this cap approval, um, as Commissioner Ackerman noted, that I, I think it's important that we will continue to have uh, for lack of a better term, additional bites at the apple um, at the OGDP process, because we are going to do some additional site-specific um, approvals for this. Um, but I do appreciate that the, the applicant has taken steps to make sure that we are, as much as possible, avoiding minimizing and mitigating emissions uh, and other impacts to, to different resources. Um, and and overall, I, I think this is a good right step. And, and I also want to say that I agree with Commissioner Messner that, you know, I, I hope that recognizing that they do have the ability, but I hope that in the future, um, applicants do take, take use of the preliminary setting, because I think that will be a helpful process overall. I know that it will take additional time, but I think it'll also be more efficient for both operators and the commission in the long run in trying to make sure that we have everything planned out ahead of time and kind of create the regulatory certainty as we move forward and kind of expedite that OGD process. All right, um, <clears throat> I'm not seeing further deliberative um, thoughts. Uh, I too believe that with the edits, the amendments, the work that we've done together here, this is an approvable Bronco cap. Um, very appreciative to uh, the client and the operator for the work that's been done here. Um, Ms. Jones, what I'd like to do now is provide a 10 minute break and allow you and your clients to uh, finalize the slide that would be the quote revised ask, if that's okay. Um, I see Mr. Davenport has uh, arrived on scene. Um, if you could, during the 10 minute break, if you could share that with, with our AAG. Um, that would be helpful so that he's able to sort of start off our uh, deliberative, next deliberative phase with some guidance to the commissioners. Does, is, is, is that fair? Yeah, sure. That, that works great for us. And we've been working on the slide and we will have it over to both Ms. Larson and Mr. Davenport here in just a few minutes. Great. Then let's return at 10.04. That's 10 minutes from now. Great. Thank you.
Okay, we are getting started again. Um, welcome back all commissioners. Uh, Ms. Jost, um, I think the floor is yours. If you wanted to provide us with a slide or something else for our deliberative process. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm going to go ahead and screen share the slide that has been also shared with um, Ms. Larson and AAG Davenport. So as you can see on the screen, we have updated slide 39, Chair, at your request to include a confirmation that upon approval of the Bronco CAP application and Exhibit 4, Comprehensive Area Plan dated August 5th, 2022, and um, we respectfully request that the following rights be conveyed to Kermagee to support the development of the application lands. Before I move on, um, we did want to put the specific date of the exhibit for because we did have an original, an amended, and then a red line in clean. So we wanted the record to reflect that we are seeking approval of the August 5th exhibit four that was submitted to the commission. And then if you look at bullet point three, um, this reflects the form. 2B commitments, a um, um, little bit different. We're trying to stick with the language of the rule, but this provides that if the commission approves a cap, the operator need not separately evaluate cumulative impacts for each individual oil and gas development plan proposed within the cap, as would otherwise be required by rule 303A5, comma, unless requested by staff or the director. Um, we believe that this insertion of the bold language reflects the commission staff's ability to ask for additional information if the process is ultimately revised to request two Bs at the cap level OGDP stage. Um, but it also reflects rule 301 that allows the director to request additional information as well. And so we included staff or director. And then the last bullet was to um, reflect the full approval of the wildlife mitigation plan reference. And this is the language that I did refer to during our conversation today that states a comprehensive wildlife mitigation plan that has been prepared in formal consultation with Colorado Parks and Wildlife will be submitted prior to the first OGDP submittal. So we believe we've captured the modifications that would need to be um, considered by this commission. Um, when reviewing the requested relief today. Okay, commissioners, um, we have this draft before us. Um, <clears throat> do folks have uh, deliberative thoughts around the draft that's before us? And also, um, Ms. Larson, um, as we are recognizing commissioners, if you could bring Ms. Trask to the panel, if she's not already to the panel, I just would like to provide staff one last opportunity for comment um, on this matter. Uh, Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the slide. I think that's helpful. I did have a question around the um kind of the the 2b bullet the third bullet there <clears throat> and aag davenport correct me if i'm wrong but at least i believe typically during the rules staff and director are, are one and the same unless there was a reason that there would that that would be separated and so if there's a reason i understand that and then i wonder why the commission itself was uh was left out of that as potentially needing to request that in our review of an OGDP um, to determine if it was necessary or not. Hey, G. Davenport. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Messner. Um, I, in regard to your question, in regard to the difference between staff or the director in the language, I, I'm fine with it as proposed. I think we do sort of um, informally refer to staff as to include the director. This clarifies that it can be done. The request can be made by either staff or the director. So I don't have a problem with the language as proposed. In regard to your question, in regard to the commission requesting that form to be or additional information, uh, I do think the commission has the ability to do that. If you would like to include that in this language, then I think that's appropriate as well. 
Mr. Messer. Uh, I mean, I guess question to the applicant, do you see any issue with, uh, you know, having the commission um, specified in that? Um, no, Commissioner, we do not have any concerns with that. And I can maybe give you just a little bit more of a background for why we <laughs> didn't put commission in there. We were not intentionally cutting you out by any means. Um, we were just kind of following the OGDP process that typically goes to staff director's recommendation and commission. Happy to include the commission in there. Thank you very much. Further thoughts from commissioners? Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. I appreciate uh, Ms. Jost and her client taking a look at this language. I, I might have misunderstood the direction. I also expected to see something associated with a recognition of the timing stipulations that we discussed in this slide. Um, Again, my understanding is that, uh, you know, a cap should include the best management practices for wildlife, for uh, air and other things. Uh, my stance is that uh, the timing stipulations, the winter timing stipulations are the primary best management practice for wildlife uh, in this area, in the pronghorn HPH winter concentration area. And I uh, didn't see any mention of acknowledgement of that as a BMP and something that uh, would be attempted to be worked with uh, in in uh, these applications. Can you talk a little bit more, Ms. Jost, about the reluctance to include that BMP and, and uh, as, as it's, it's difficult for me to move this forward without uh, at least recognition of that best management practice? Yes, Commissioner Ackerman. And what, one of the reasons is there's really not a reluctance for purposes of recognizing um, your position on timing stipulations for purposes of the cap. Um, that's just not part of our requested relief. We believe that that would be better in the written order um, that's produced from the commission staff as a finding um, from the commission versus a portion of the requested relief. And so if I may actually ask AAG Davenport um, if there's, we could, you know, kind of work through that for purposes of the cap order itself. Um, it's probably more logistics on how the order is drafted because the formal order that the commission staff will prepare based upon the vote today will have a finding section and then it will have an order section. And the order section contains our requested relief basically if approved as approved by the commission. And since Kermagee is not requesting the relief on timing stipulations, we feel that that's better suited for a findings provision versus a portion of our requested relief. So I, I think what can happen here then, Ms. Jost, is, um, you know, the order can, you know, uh, regurgitate the rule, right, that talks about you know, reasonable and necessary usage of timing restrictions, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't know exactly what it says, but as long as the order in AG Davenport, I'm kind of looking at you now, the order reflects or mirrors the rule, I believe that the concern that's being raised would be addressed in the order. And then as to each OGDP, there would be a, you know, evaluation of the avoidance, the timing restrictions, and then the minimization and mitigation on a site-specific basis. Is, is, is that fair, AG Davenport and or Ms. Jost? Mr. Chair, I'll go first if you don't mind. That'd be great. Okay. Yes, uh, the order reflects the commission's findings and conclusions in the course of its deliberations and its ultimate decision on any application, the order can certainly pursuant to commission direction reflect that the timing stipulations apply and uh, um, the various rules that would apply there as well. So uh, in effect, I'm agreeing with Ms. Jost that to the extent that um, the commission wishes for the recognition of the timing stipulations to be reflected in the findings of the order that we can certainly do that in drafting the written order. Uh, Commissioner Ackerman, does that, um, what are your thoughts? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and Ms. Jost and uh, Councillor Davenport. I really appreciate the discussion and I'm 
content with it being included in the order from the commission. Again, I do think it's an appropriate BMP. Other BMPs are listed in the cap. Um, I do think it would be more appropriate for the applicant to include it in the BMP as opposed to uh, simply an order from the commission. That said, uh, inclusion of timing stipulations in the order from the commission does address my concern and uh, won't hold up my vote. I appreciate it. Ms. Jost, are you comfortable with how this discussion has evolved? Yes, Chair, thank you. Okay. Uh, further thoughts from commissioners at this time? All right, um, with no further deliberative thoughts, uh, I'd like to call upon Ms. Trask um, for any final perspective from staff on any of this. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Robbins. Um, good morning, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to join you this morning. Um, staff just has a, a short statement. Uh, we did review the updated Exhibit 4, and we have no additional concerns with it. Um, we do have a couple of requests for the commissioners at this point, though. Um, if the commissioners do decide to approve this CAP application, staff's approach uh, to the BMPs is that all the BMPs referenced in the newest version of Exhibit 4 would be required with each subsequent OGDP application. However, uh, in order to address unique site-specific details um, at each proposed location at the OGDP level, we do have two clarifying requests that we'd like the Commission to consider if possible. Um, staff requests the option to upgrade or fine-tune the BMPs as needed um, to be no less protective than what is approved in the CAP. And staff also requests that we are able to ask for additional BMPs as needed for any impacts or concerns identified at the local level that are not addressed within the approved CAP. Very good. Uh, thank you for that clarification and those two asks. Um, does any commissioner have any concern with regards to those asked from staff. All right, I'm not seeing any. Um, AG Davenport, I'm going to put you on the spot. Craft us a motion. I will. I will do my best here. I'm wondering if um, Miss Jost, would you mind putting the slide? back on the screen. Yes, um, AAG Davenport, can you see it? Yes, I can, thank you. Can all the commissioners see it as well? Okay. I, so commissioners, I'd, um, I'd start with the motion being to approve the CAP and the application, the CAP being exhibit four, dated August 5th, 2022, submitted by Kerr McGee, as modified by the commission today, and I'll go through the modifications as well. So that's the, that's the headline motion. Uh, and that includes all of the bullets listed in this slide, as well with the following modifications. In bullet three, it would read, the last part would read, unless requested by staff, comma, the director, comma, or the commission, period. I would also note that the commission's approval of the cap, the duration of the cap is six years starting today, August 10th, 2022. Also noting that the last bullet in bold replaces the last wildlife BMP on exhibit four on page 18 of exhibit four. And then noting also the commission's direction that the written order include recognition of timing stipulations and other requirements of rules in the 1200 series. And finally, recognizing that the order should also include 
staff's request that the commission is approving that staff has the ability to modify the BMPs listed in exhibit for the cap on a site specific OGDP review so that they are as protective or no less protective than the listed BMPs in the cap. And that staff has the ability to add additional BMPs or COAs to OGDPs within the cap beyond those listed in exhibit for the cap. I believe that encompasses everything that I had in my notes. And um, I think can serve as a motion so that a commissioner, unless they would wish to make modifications to what I just said, can say so moved. Unless you have further um, things to add. Thank you very much. It really is helpful to have you encapsulate that uh, into a motion. Um, before we so move, which we potentially are going to do, but Ms. Joes, did you have any concerns about that articulation of motion? No, Chair. I think it was articulated wonderfully. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, commissioners, uh, does any commissioner desire to so move? So moved. We have a second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, is there further discussion? Mr. Chair, just, a, just an acknowledgement of Commissioner Ackerman's um, uh, request for the record that uh, that it is clear in our rules that uh, that in high priority habitat, it is essential that we first avoid, then minimize, then mitigate, and that timing stipulations are the primary tool for avoidance. And so I just want to continue to acknowledge that and hope that um, Mr. Moret also acknowledges that as he does the um, comprehensive wildlife with uh, very good uh, other commissioners with final thoughts well i just would like to um thank staff uh for the hard work here uh thank the applicant for the hard work um appreciate the applicant's uh willingness to uh, go back to the table and 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 the final drafting, which I believe has created an approvable motion for our first comprehensive area plan. Um, big fan, and um, think this is the right direction for the state of Colorado and this operator. So, with that, I would look for uh, folks that desire to approve the motion to signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? motion carried. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Jost, uh, and thank you to your team. Thank you um, very with much. With that, <clears throat> um, I believe uh, Ms. Larson desired that we take a 10-minute break before we proceed to our next agenda item, so let's return at 10.33. Okay, great. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, <clears throat> this is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. It is our Wednesday, August 10th meeting. Um, we now will take up docket number 21110213. Uh, it is an OGDP called the Horseshoe Oil and Gas Development Plan. It is for St. Croix Operating Incorporated. And um, I believe that the order of play is the one public commenter first, followed by the applicant's presentation and then commissioner questions and deliberation. Uh, Ms. Larson, uh, Ms. Dugan signed up to comment on this application as well. Is that correct? That is correct. And Ms. Dugan was in the meeting um, until just a moment ago, and she's left. Um, so she's no longer available to provide public comment at this moment. Yeah, I'm looking as well. You're right. I don't see her. Okay. Well, then why don't we do this? Um, let's keep an eye out for her. And if she shows back up, uh, since she did sign up, um, we would recognize her uh, at the appropriate time. And I believe then that means that we'll go ahead um, with the applicant's presentation. Morning, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, so Jessica should be on. 
Is Jessica Donahue on? We'll bring Ms. Donahue in right now. And are there other members um, of your with your client that we should be bringing in? No, ma'am. I, I think uh, Ms. Donahue and I are gonna are gonna handle it this morning. Excellent. And if you could state your name um, for the record, that would be great. Once you get going. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chair. So my name is Chris McGowan. Um, I'm an attorney uh, at McGowan Law Offices. I represent St. Croix um, for the Horseshoe uh, Oil and Gas uh, Development Permit. Um, I'm with Ms. Donahue of Art, Art or Environmental today. Um, so she's going to run our presentation. And if she can get that, while she gets that fired up, um, I'll just start. Um, so St. Croix Operating, operator number 81490. We come before the commission today for their horseshoe OGDP and associated proposed 300 acre drilling and spacing unit. As I noted, I'm joined by Ms. Donahue of Arter Environmental. Um, St. Croix is an operator in good standing, duly authorized to conduct business here in the state of Colorado and is in compliance with all the rules and regulations of the commission. Their proposed OGDP and DSU is located in Washington County. They are proposing two vertical wells and an injection well located in section 22 and 27 respectively of Township 3 South, range 49 West, 6 p.m. The vertical wells will be drilled into the J Sandstone Formation. St. Croix is an owner with the right to drill and a surface use agreement granting them the appropriate mineral and surface rights. Washington County is the relevant local government and there are no proximate local governments. St. Croix has complied with all requirements for this permit, including proper notice to all the interested parties. And the permit otherwise satisfies all the commission's rules and regulations and the director has recommended approval. So we're up, we'll just give a brief quick overview um, and then I'm gonna uh, go over the DSU briefly and then turn it over to Ms. Donahue. Um, St. Croix was founded in 1996. Um, as I noted, operator uh, 81490, they have operations in Colorado, Montana, North Dakota and Wyoming. Their Colorado operations are focused in Washington County. They've been doing it for a little while. They operate a few wells in Washington County. Um, their focus is on operating in a manner that protects public health, safety, and welfare and the environment and wildlife resources. They drill mostly in rural areas and they have active engagement with Washington County community members and leaders. And I know Ms. Ms. Donahue will touch a little bit on that. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, just briefly, a quick overview of the DSU. So the DSU, we're, we're requesting um, a 320 acre drilling and spacing unit. It's the northeast quarter of section 27th and then southeast quarter of section 22. They basically stack on top of each other. They roll right over the formation that, uh, the, that St. Croix intends to drill into. They do own 100% of the leasehold and have leased uh, the service. So there are no other uh, mineral, there's no unleased mineral owners. They, they have 100% of both and their owner, uh, they've worked uh, closely with their owner to make sure to locate the wells appropriately and the like. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Donahue. She's gonna go over the OGDP and, and, and associated um, um, best management practices and the like, so. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Jessica Donahue. I'm with Arter Environmental, as Mr. McGowan mentioned. I'm here on behalf of St. Croix Operating. St. Croix has submitted the Horseshoe OGDB for your review. In this OGDP, St. Croix is proposed to construct three separate locations. In those three locations, there will be two vertical oil wells, one class two UIC injection well, and one shared production facility. Development in the surrounding area and throughout St. Croix's operations have shown that no natural gas is anticipated in the area. On this slide, we just gave you that quick summary, also the timeline of when the OGDP was filed. We got our completeness in April of 2022 went through its 30 day public comment, which ended in May of 2022. We received no public comments during that process. The petition deadline for comments ended July 8th of 2022 and also no petitions were filed during that. So here's a summary of the disturbance details. So the way St. The horseshoe number one and the horseshoe number two will be the vertical oil well development. They will be approximately six acres each during drilling. 
they are in irrigated cropland. So once the drilling is completed and they are on production, they will be reclaimed and go back into active agricultural usage by the landowner. So the anticipated interim reclamation will be approximately 0 0.002 acres. It'll be about a 10 by 10 space around the wellhead since all the production facilities will be located at the, the third location outside of the cropland. The horseshoe production facility location will be initially about five and a half acres. Once every the injection well is drilled and everything is built and constructed with the production equipment, it'll be brought down to about 1.77 interim acres. And that'll be the long-term disturbance as it supports the other wells. There will be access roads and off-location flow lines to connect the producing oil wells to the production facility. Those will be co-located to minimize the disturbance corridors. And so once the off-location flow lines are constructed, that disturbance will be completely reclaimed and it'll just be the access roads into the producing wells that'll remain for long, the long term. So some location details about the project. Horseshoe number one and number two, those will be the single well vertical oil wells. Production facility will have the horseshoe number three injection class two UIC well. As I mentioned, the one and two are within the irrigated crop land. Number three location is in rangeland. The, um, all the locations are located near county roads in Washington County. And all of the locations are greater than one mile from residential buildings, disproportionately impacted communities, school facilities, child care facilities, and that kind of thing. So approximate timing for the project. St. Croix intends to drill this project in the fall. So their general timing is about one week to construct a location, one week to drill the well, and one week to clean it out and get it onto production. These wells are not hydraulically fractured, so completion operations is more of just a clean out and get everything prepped and connected to production equipment. An example of a recent project that St. Croix worked on, I don't know if you recall back in March, we came with, before you for the Vaquero project. That well was spud on April 29th, and the drilling was completed on May 4th. So their time, their drilling time frame is very short. So hopefully we'll get constructed, drilled, and on production before the end of the year. And then interim reclamation will most likely occur in the spring when planting is more beneficial. All three locations are within high priority habitat. St. Croix began to engage with CPW on the habitat in June of 21. We worked with Brandon Moret. Um, the locations are within two different high priority habitats as defined by 1202D. They're in Greater Prairie Chicken Production Area and Pronghorn Winter Concentration Area. So looking at the habitats with, um, we worked with CPW and we discussed it. The only trigger that would have been for an alternative location analysis would have been if CPW had requested it, but looking at the mineral leasehold that St. Croix has these locations and discussing the short duration of the time frame for drilling and larger active operations, we determined that an alternative location would not be necessary. As you can see on the map, the black box is the mineral development area that St. Croix is targeting. And you can see from all the lovely colorful amoebas, that's our high priority habitat. So, and the red circle is a one mile radius. So to have found a alternative location that would not be within the high priority habitat and more protective of the environment than what's currently proposed, we would be well outside our mineral development target area. And with these being vertical wells, there's not a lot of technical feasibility to be able to directionally drill these from over a mile away. So we, work, we did work out a wildlife mitigation plan with Brandon and CPW. Each location will have a direct impact fee of the $13,750. We determined the indirect impact mitigation fee for the project would be $45,570. CPW will conduct the mitigation on behalf of St. Croix. During the discussions due to the distance from all the, a lot of the sensitive receptors, our agreement to try to target our large operations like drilling outside of the timing stipulation, timing limitation framework. 
we have CPW did concur with St. Croix's request for a lesser impact exemption on noise and light, but we did also agree that we will obviously um, have our lights turned downwards and things so that it's not broadcasting across the landscape to impact potential wildlife in the area. Some other BMPs that we did agree to would be the timing stipulation for pronghorn, which is January 1st to April 30th. St. Croix will be entirely out of there and not conduct any large operations during that time. They will try to schedule all their operations outside of the greater prairie chicken timing stipulation, which is March 1st to June 30th. And currently, once they dis we discussed all of that and then we talked to the landowner and stuff, we did determine that this fall would be the best time to drill so that we don't interact with either the wildlife habitat timing limitations or interfere with his planting and agricultural operations as well. For the, with the horseshoe one and the horseshoe number two being inside the irrigated cropland, that reclamation will be a seed mixture as proposed by the landowner. But the horseshoe production facility being in rangeland, we will work with the landowner to acquire permission to utilize a CPW recommended seed mix for that interim reclamation. St. Croix currently does not anticipate utilizing any fencing, but if we do use fencing, we will use CPW recommended fencing practices. And that is the summary of our project overall. We, um, some other considerations when we were working with CPW, they did express to us that greater prairie chickens do prefer habitat that is further away from the county roads. So with our projects being within a um, less than 700 meters from the county road, we should avoid a lot of the potential sensitive conflicts that way. Um, Washington County itself does not have a permitting process for oil and gas, but St. Croix has been operating in Washington County for a very long time and they have a very good relationship with all the different aspects and agencies within Washington County. So while we don't go through a permitting process, we do work with the different departments, for example, like on the emergency response plan, haul routes, access routes, and things like that. And we also work with them to make sure that the roads that we propose to access these operations off of the county roads are acceptable to the road and built bridge department. And also the uh, another question that we had been asked was if the production facility would serve only these two wells or other things. Currently, these are the only wells that are proposed in the area. Otherwise, we would have more stuff in our OGDP. But um, in the future, if St. Croix does identify future locations in the area, they will obviously and absolutely analyze this facility to support those future operations and utilize the existing disturbance and the existing infrastructure as much as possible. So, commissioners have any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> do commissioners have questions for the panel? Commissioner McGowan? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and um, thank you for the presentation and answering some questions that I had. Um, and, I, and I recognize that Washington County doesn't have their, a formal permitting process, but I assume that based on what you've said, there, there's discussion ahead of time of we were thinking about this location and here's the road that we might use so that if we approve something, it's not like a handing it over to Washington County and saying we have this permit and we get to do it and you're kind of stuck with this, the location and the decision of the commission that you all have some sort of relationship and county um, relationship and conversation with the county as yes. this is progressing. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and I Mr. Chair, I, I think I, and I am going to assume maybe some of our other commissioners have some questions for CPW. This, this was confusing to me as to how direct versus indirect mitigation um, fees were determined, given that all the locations are within prior, high priority habitat. And um, I appreciated Ms. Donahue's uh, description of, you know, how, I'm not sure what word to use here, but how um, useful the habitat actually is for the two, for the pronghorn and the greater prairie chicken. And so I was wondering if 
um, CPW wanted to talk a little bit about how they came up with this decision with the operator, the mitigation fees and, and the quality of the habitat. That's what I wanted to say, the quality of the habitat. So I see that uh, we have Ms. Trask with us. Um, I also see that uh, we are bringing uh, Mr. Moret to the panel. So let's bring both of those. Hello, good to see you all. Um, does anyone, did, did you guys hear Commissioner McGowan's questions? Um, do, do either of you desire to weigh in on that? Uh, Ms. Trask. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and, and thank you, Commissioner McGowan for the question. Um, I do want to take a moment, and I, and I appreciate being given the moment, uh, to provide some clarification on the director's recommendation. Uh, the recommendation um, did not include some critical information that is found in the OGDP application material, so I'd like to present it here for the record, if I may. Um, in the CPW consultation documents attached to the Form 2A, CPW made a recommendation to the director that compensatory mitigation fees for indirect impacts are not necessary for the Horseshoe 2 location. Uh, and CPW also requested uh, the director grant an, an exception from compensatory mitigation requirement pursuant to rules 1203A3 and 309E. This request was not detailed in the director's recommendation, nor was it formally responded to. So through additional consultation between staff and Mr. Moret and CPW throughout the technical review of this OGDP, staff defers to the expertise of CPW and Mr. Moret and does grant this exception. Uh Ms. Donahue, did you raise your hand? Yes, if I may, and I, I don't mean to speak on behalf of CPW, but we, when we did begin, when St. Croix did begin consultation with CPW in June, they did send a representative out to assess the quality of the habitat. And then through further discussions and along our consultation, which occurred essentially from June until October, so it was a process, we, determined that due to the brevity of time frame for operations of the drilling for the horseshoe number one and the horseshoe number two, I believe that is also what helped inform CPW's decision to waive indirect impact fees for the horseshoe number two. And we focused on the horseshoe number three, the production facility that would have the greater amount of long-term disturbance. Ms. McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And for me, I think I'm just trying to clarify our own rules. And so if you could just bear with me, I would really appreciate it. So um, I understand the, the direct impact fees and they've been applied to all three sites. So we have two wells and one production facility. The production facility does have applied indirect compensatory mitigation applied to it. One of the, if I'm understanding correctly, one of the wells does not, and one of the wells does, or do are both, and, and I, I'm trying to understand, looking at our rules, why the first well does not, but the second well does, given that they're all in similar habitat. And so if that could just be clarified, I would really appreciate that. Who would like to tackle that clarification? Ms. Trask? I can, I can jump in. Thank you again, uh, Commissioner McGowan. So I, I might end up um, asking Brandon to jump in here as he's a little more familiar with this section of our rules than I am. But my understanding for the, the first location, it is the first location in the area. So it does not um, trigger um, indirect mitigation because it is the first location. There are no other locations existing out there. Um, the second location then would um, necessarily require indirect mitigation. However, through consult the consultation process between uh, the applicant and CPW uh, and eventually staff, um, that indirect, um, indirect impact mitigation fee was granted an exception by the director uh, because CPW 
made the determination that those fees were not necessary um, for that location. The production facility does have indirect fees associated with it because of the longevity of operations happening there. So I, I may have misspoke. Brandon, if you, or Mr. Moret, if you can jump in and, and provide further clarification, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Mr. Chair, may I? Please. And I assume I should introduce myself for the record. That would be great. Uh, thank you, uh, commissioners um, and interested members of the public. My name's Brandon Moret. I'm uh, with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I'm a certified wildlife biologist. Um, and my job title is I'm the Northeast Region Energy Liaison. And so um, back to um, Commissioner McGowan, that's a great question. This was definitely uh, one of the more trickier sites on um, two different levels, one with the types of habitat out there and, and the other one uh, with the rules. And as Ms. Trask um, articulated per rule 1202D, uh, it, the density of the oil and gas locations need to exceed one per square mile. And so because this is the first in the landscape, it still allows pronghorn in this instance to uh, be able to move about the majority of the section of land. And so it's not until there is the, this um, uh, calculation of greater than five wells per section on average uh, that there is a reduced use for pronghorn on the landscape. And so, uh, that was the reason why the Southern one, which, um, which St. Croix articulated to me would be the first one. And so the first one, the indirect is waived, but direct is waived. And if you go to the North one, that one does meet the definition of the rule. But in this particular instance, and again, you know, these OGDPs are uh, visited and assessed site by site. So there's not a one rule, one, uh, there's not a one formula that CPW uses, not formula, not a one, it's, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, not a one size fits all for each, for each location. Sorry about that. And so um, with this particular instance, with the Northern one, uh, based on um, the discussion that has happened, uh, CPW recommended CHC to waive the indirect. Uh, but for the direct, I'm sorry, for the production facility, like you mentioned, it is still in the pronghorn high priority habitat and indirect fees for outside the winter season were assessed. We also uh, provided um, St. Croix um, options um, and, and dollar and acre amounts for if they wanted to go in the uh, drill within the production season. But obviously as Commissioner Ackerman and others have mentioned previously, our first choice is avoidance of that season. And so uh, we appreciate um, St. Croix choosing these locations close proximity to the county road and also outside the pronghorn winter season. Does that answer your question, Commissioner McGowan? Thank you, Mr. Moret. I, I think so. So I, um, I, I, sorry, I'm just working through making sure I understand our own rules. And so I do think the way that I am reading the indirect impact rule is if it's if it's less than five per square mile, the first site doesn't automatically get a pass at indirect fees. There is a recommendation from CPW as to whether or not it should apply. If I if I'm understanding correctly. And then the second one, then now all of a sudden you have one to five per square mile, and then there should be an indirect fee. So that the second site and the well, I'm trying to understand, it, it, it will be there for a long time. It will have an indirect impact. It's the second one, but we've waived it. And is that because we don't really feel like over a long term, it's gonna have an effect on the pronghorn or the greater prairie chicken? Is that why we've waived the indirect fee on the second well site? I understand the production facility, I'm good there. Yep, and for that, thank you for the question. And if I may, Chair Robbins, uh, answer. Um, yes, um, and that's why it's a site-specific um, circumstance. It is gonna be a very small footprint, but yes, to your point, it will be on the landscape for however long it can produce. And so, and also, you know, given that it is a 10 by 10 site and pad after reclamation and also, you know, once the, um, 
you know, and it is being constructed outside of the pronghorn season. Those were the factors and the having multiple discussions with CPW field staff, just talking about how the habitat itself is uh, fair quality for the northern site. Um, in this particular instance, we recommended that. And now, now that is not something that we would do. That would be, this case is more the exception than the rule. So I don't see us waiving um, indirect um, very regularly. This is definitely an exception. Thank you. Okay, further questions for any members of the panel? Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Moran, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about, um, I had read within the application, I believe, um, uh, that there was gonna be adherence to the timing stipulations for new construction, and I appreciate that. There was also some discussion in there, and maybe it was a recommendation by you, but I didn't see it captured in the BMPs, that there was gonna be minimization of general activity associated with those sites um, during those times during production, um, uh, at one point potentially limiting to two trips a day um, or something along those lines. I didn't see those captured in the, in the BMPs, and I wonder if you could chat a little bit about that. Mr. Moret. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, there there should be, and maybe that's more of a question uh, for Arter to answer, but yes, there should be um, a reduced traffic along the county road during the winter season. Uh, but then again, you know, it is located in close proximity to a road where um, the, you know, that is currently out there versus in the middle of the landscape. Um, that would be where I would have more concerns, so. So if you were to craft or suggest a BMP for that, um, is it limiting to two trips per day per location during those timing stipulations generally, or um, do you wanna be more specific than that? Thank you, Commissioner Messner. Yes, it would be limiting the truck traffic and especially ensuring that the truck traffic happens in the warmest parts of the day. Uh, during the winter months, and that is what we are um, most concerned about is, you know, trucks happening in, in the coldest of winter days, first thing in the morning or in late afternoon. So that's, that would be the proposal that I would craft as far as, um, say, somewhere between um, 10 to 2 or 9 to 3. Uh, probably nine to three for reducing truck traffic during January 1st to uh, April 30th per the winter stips for the pronghorn. That's right. That's what I actually remember seeing. And I guess I'll ask the applicant because perhaps I'm missing it, but is that missing in the, in the BMPs associated with the 2A or um, am I making this up? If I may commission, um, I, off the top of my head, I don't recall what BMPs we put on the 2A. Uh, often we've, as a permit preparer, we've been encouraged to limit the amount of BMPs we put on the 2A and let staff add those themselves. But we do have that in our wildlife mitigation plan under our minimization measures. So yes, St. Croix is committed to minimizing the amount of visits daily to the site and the traffic during timing stipulations. Oh, thank you for that. And I did see it in your in your wildlife mitigation plan, so I appreciate that. My understanding is, is that the 2A uh, and the BMPs associated with it are, are, are the enforceable document. And so it's important that they carry over to that 2A in the, in the BMPs, so. Com Commissioner Mesner, um, so we have a, a land testimony um, and our, our engineer, Mr. Peterson, just wanted to add that there's a very active dairy on the county road with quite a few trips. So just for a little context for everyone. And then Mr. Peterson noted there's about 2.01 trips all day year round. So I just wanted to add that for the record. Is I may, Mr. Chair. Or Ms. Larson or Ms. Mercer. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to clarify that um, the uh, any commitments in the wildlife mitigation plan are binding, um, just like the BMPs in the 2A. I think where we've had uh, more nuanced discussions around this before is if there's a case where there are conflicting um, commitments in a plan versus in the BMPs and the 2A, we do look to the 2A as the controlling document. Um, so if there's a conflict there, the, the 2A um, in our view is what governs, but where in a case like this, there is no conflict, but a commitment from the plan just isn't carried over into the 2A, uh, that commitment is still binding. Ms. Trask, did you want to provide additional commentary? Yes, I appreciate uh, the comments from AG Mercer. I was going to sort of reiterate the same thing. Um, yeah, any any BMPs that are provided in a plan um, are enforceable. Um, but to just make things more clear, um, in this OGDP, staff will transfer those specific BMPs from the plans directly into the Form 2A, so they are much more highly visible. Others with questions? Commissioner Cross? I just had one quick point of clarification. Um, in looking through the BMPs on the 2A, uh, under the wildlife BMP, it notes that uh, for the greater prairie chicken, you will avoid greater prairie chicken timing limitations uh, the, between March 1st and June 30th. But I thought I saw in one of Ms. Donahue's slides that it said, I think it said avoid to the extent possible. And so I just wanted to make sure that we were we were clear on that as well. If I may, Commissioner, um, when we were consulting with CPW, having the overlaying dual habitats, the quality of the habitat and the proximity to the road we determined that the pronghorn would be more likely to utilize the habitat more so than greater prairie chicken. So a lot of the best management practices and firm commitments initially were focused on pronghorn avoidance. That's why in our wildlife mitigation plan, the language is St. Corey will avoid January to April 30th or April. And then we discussed if feasible and practical, we'll avoid the greater prairie chicken timing as much as possible. But initially St. Croix was concerned about committing to essentially not being able to access the location for a minimum of six months out of the year. Then at, after submittal and St. Croix's worked through with the surface owner, we did determine that they would be drilling in the fall and not next spring as they had initially planned or thought they would. So in talking with COGCC staff, we did change that language to um, modified it for the 2A that they will avoid greater prairie chicken timing as well as pronghorn. Thank you. Commissioner Cross. Other questions? Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the uh, avoidance and minimization measures here and the discussion about, uh, about mitigation as well. Um, just one point of clarification, and uh, I believe you've got pipelines going from the wellheads to the production facility. Uh, materials will then be trucked from the production facility at that point uh, to the uh, to the next location, there's no connecting third party pipeline. Is that correct? That is correct, Commissioner. Thank you. And can you estimate uh, the number of, of truck trips necessary to offload the, uh, the hydrocarbons from that production facility? I believe at most it would probably be about one trip per day. Because that keeps with our standard um, typical visits to location would be one visit by a gentleman in a pickup truck daily. That would be their St. Croix field representative. And hydrocarbons at most could be one trip per day. But I, 
more than likely with St. Croix's typical production in the Washington County area, it must it might be much more like twice a month for the um, oil haulers. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Other questions? Really appreciate the commissioner questions here and the panel's responses. I think this provides good additional clarification for us. Um, seeing no further questions, are we ready to move into deliberations, commissioners? And if so, does someone want to lead off? Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy to lead off. Um, uh, I <clears throat> I think generally this is a good location for oil and gas development. I appreciate the uh, the application and the work that staff has done on the application to get it before us. Um, I do acknowledge that the big receptors in this area are two different high priority habitats, and so. BMPs associated with those high priority habitats um, are important to this commissioner. I think that uh, there has been consistent consultation with CPW. I do think that the wildlife mitigation plan does address some uh, of the most important avoidance pieces, which is timing stipulations. I do think those timing stipulations are important for new construction as well as enforceable for ongoing production to limit the amount of traffic uh, associated with these facilities during those um, uh, critical timing uh, stipulations for the uh, pronghorn and the uh, and the sage grouse, so or the prairie chicken. Sorry, I come from Gunnison, so sage grouse is a big deal there. <laughs> um, and so, um, uh, so anyway, I'm uh, I'm supportive of the application. I'm supportive of uh, uh, of the project and. Uh, um, uh, would be willing to put a motion forward uh, to approve. I believe we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion around the motion? Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. McGowan and Ms. Donahue for the presentation. Um, your project has been approved. Thank you, Mr. Chair and commissioners. Thank you, Commission, for taking our time today. And thanks again to the staff for the great work um, on the application and bringing it before us. Um, with that, uh, I believe we have concluded the matters that were set forth on our agenda. Uh, does any commissioner have anything else at this time? Seeing none, I would look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. So second. Motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Great work. <laughs>